Hello and welcome to another Ken 7 podcast and joining me for a little football chat is none other than goals Neil Jones. Neil, welcome. How are you, mate? You all right? Yeah, I'm not too bad, mate. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, thanks for coming on. Obviously, I accosted you outside the, uh, the, the main stand for the Vermley game. Um, I think I was going to talk about the transfer window. We'll get on to that. But I think the the first thing I want to talk to you about is this Brazilian situation. I mean, as as we stand, our players are banned from playing on Sunday. Um, there's some stuff going on in the in the background. What, you know, what what's your understanding of the situation? Obviously, we, we've got Jurgen Klopp's going to talk to us in a couple of hours. So, what's your yeah. understanding of it as as we stand now? Well, yeah, as it stands, I think Liverpool have got a plan for the game without without Allison and Fabinho. I think Firmino would have missed it anyway, so that's mitigated a little bit. Um, I think it's a situation that's been brewing for a while with you know with the with with the the pandemic and but also I think with the amount of Traveling and games that are being shoehorned into international breaks. I mean, we've seen Jürgen talk about it many, many times, and you know the idea that the South American countries they, they shoehorned a Copper America into their the schedule this year. And I was listening to something recently, that, you know, before this international break, they were saying they've got to play twelve World Cup qualifiers. You know, it, it, which is it, it's incredible, isn't it? To think you know the, the onus that's going to be on the players there, and and the, the amount of travel, the amount of um, logistics that are involved in this instance you know the Premier League clubs or the European clubs made a, a real sort of effort to, to stick together and to, to not send their players um, I know a few clubs or a couple of clubs sort of went against that with the Argentinian players but um, it's, it's just a strange one I mean I can see I can see what Brazil's argument is in the sense of if you let allow this then you're getting players pulling out of every every sort of game and there's no consequences. You know, you're getting clubs just saying, oh, no, we're not sending him. He's got a hamstring strain or whatever and you, you don't have to take them. But you look at what happened and you look, you look at the fact that public health officials were on the pitch trying to arrest players that were that, were, that had travelled over for that Brazil-Argentina game and we saw the farcical scenes there. So Brazil saying that Liverpool and Leeds and Manchester City and Manchester United and Chelsea should have put their players in that situation. I don't think that's that's reasonable. Um, and obviously, the fact that the, the government didn't, the UK government didn't allow the exemption for the quarantine rules, which I think, I think there's a fair argument why they wouldn't do that, given given the, 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 the constraints the rest of the world are under. And, you know, the fact that you'd see players coming in and out of Brazil and, and being able to go about their business, I don't think that would sit right with the general public. So I can see the argument, but it's, it just seems like to me the Brazilian situation here feels like a bit of a petty, a petty response. And I think the best way of emphasising that probably is the, the Richarlison situation and the fact that Brazil aren't willing to enforce that. And that's got nothing to do with Liverpool Everton. It's got nothing to do with individual player or whatever. It's about well, if your issue is that you feel the players were unfairly withdrawn from you, then you have to you have to treat everyone the same. And Brazil aren't doing that. Mm. I mean, th- that rule is brought in is 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 basically about people feigning injury because they can't. Yeah. It's not about a pandemic, and these are two separate situations. Is have the, have you heard anything about you know the FA having a, a view on that, saying you're applying the rule to the wrong situation? Yeah, I mean, I, it's very difficult because the rules will have all kinds of interpretations. I know Liverpool's feeling is that. What, what right have FIFA got to tell them what what type what player they can play? And there's also, I mean, it, the FIFA's rule is if you if you do play an eligible player, you you forfeit the game 3-0. But Liverpool could be in a situation where they play theirs and Leeds play theirs. And so what what happens in that situation? You know, are FIFA willing to take on? I mean, these are the biggest clubs in England. You know, the the, the, the big four are all are all affected by this. Are they willing to sort of make that kind of move? Are the clubs willing to should say, do you know what? We don't care about the three points. We want to make a stand because the the thing that's on the horizon is there's two more international breaks between now and the end of the, the, the calendar year. There's, mm-hmm. there's one next month, there's one in November. So what happens then? Are you going to be in the same situation? Are you going to be looking at you know threats again? Are you going to be looking at players having to go and do 10-day quarantine or 
this absurd situation that Tottenham found themselves in. I think where they're sending players to Croatia to to, to carry on training so they can leave the hotel. And I mean, what we're, the sport integrity isn't is certainly challenged in, in that regards. And it's not a question, like you say, it's not a question of Liverpool sort of saying to Bobby Firmino, listen, just toss this one off for us, and you know, well, let's have you in the Premier League. You know, it, this is this is public health issue and Liverpool will argue and Manchester City would argue and Manchester United that what they're doing is they're adhering to the public health guidelines in this country where these players live and work and where, you know, this their clubs have responsibility. Just finally on this, is what's your feeling? How do you think it'll go? I think the players won't play personally. I think I think they'll they'll be left out. Um in Liverpool's case, I I, I mean United and Chelsea are in a different situation because they have they have two games affected by it. They have their Champions League game on Tuesday, right. which you know, and it's only one player, so you could argue. I mean, you can make your arguments about Fred. I knew you were your arguments, that. But, but, but you know, what, but, but that's not really that isn't really the issue. Obviously, I think Liverpool will probably swallow it and say, "Look, you know, we want a resolution. We want to really take this somewhere further for the next time." This well, that, can't that's the again. issue, isn't it? That's the issue. It's yeah. the next time and the next time. Like there needs to be some sort of guidance, yeah. guidelines, so that they're not in this situation again. Yeah, well, I, I think that's what that's what the focus will be. I think it'll be on fo- finding a resolution for the next two international breaks. I think maybe the clubs might swallow it this time and say, "Okay, one game, we'll we'll take our players out of the situation." But we haven't had the last of it. Certainly, there'll be a lot of discussions going on, and I think there'll be a lot of. Um, I, I think Jurgen's press conference, for example, will be very interesting today. And I'd say the same about Pep and and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Of course, we'll leave that now. Uh, I just want to have a quick chat about the transfer window because obviously, I mean, I, I was watching your podcasts on the Red Men TV every week, just looking to glean some sort of insight on, you know, someone we might be signing. And obviously, you know, we, we brought Canati in early and people tend to forget that we did actually sign someone, but it just felt like we didn't sign anyone. What's your... What what were you hearing around the time, and what's your personal thoughts on you know the fact that we didn't do any business? It, 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 did that disappoint you? Um, I wouldn't say it disappointed me. I mean, it's not not down to me to, to, to tell Liverpool what they should be doing or not. But I I, I thought they would have. I, I thought there'd be one more at least come in. I think with with the Afcon and with the doubts that persist around Minamino Origi, I thought there would have been a. a I would. I've expected Liverpool to bring a forward in. I think that would have been the ideal situation for them. I can see the midfield argument. I, you know, when when Juan Alden leaves, you think that's fifty games you're having to replace. You know, are you going to be able to trust Naby Keita and Oxley Chamber and these others? But when you look at it on paper, and you've got Curtis Jones being left out of the squad because they've got too many midfielders at the moment, it is hard to see the obvious mm-hmm. signing. You know, I know there were a lot of players linked, and I know Renato Sanchez was one of those, but. To me, he doesn't look. To me, he doesn't look like a player who just goes straight in and, and plays every game for Liverpool. So I don't. I didn't see the maybe the merit in signing that. I did see the merit in signing a, a forward who can be part of the rotation options and come off the bench. And I thought we saw that maybe in the in the Chelsea game where Minamino was on the bench. And you think he's never coming on in that game. There was no. There was no instance where Minamino was coming on in that game unless Liverpool were six 0 up, mm. which was, was not going to happen. So. I think probably what made it worse for fans was obviously what was happening elsewhere. And, you know, there's a lot of talk isn't there, about how much other clubs have strengthened and whatever. I mean, Manchester United have an anomaly in that regards in terms of what they've done. And, you know, they've taken a a crazy plunge, really, in terms of signing a you know, 36-year-old player on an awful lot of money. It does, does an obviously a... a prestige element to that as much That's as... That's so uh, on Liverpool to do something like that. Yeah, Liverpool would never do that. Not Liverpool a chance. Do that. And I don't think fans would I don't think fans would, would want them to do that particularly. You know, maybe some would, but when you look at City, City only signed one player. I know it's a £100 million sign, but they only signed one player. They lost to Guero. So, you, you know, they haven't... City haven't splurged and, and become that. Chelsea have signed one player and then, and then bought a loan player in on the last day. So, I think it was probably overplayed a little bit because they were they were bigger names maybe that, that, that those clubs would sign. But in terms of how much they're actually improving, United are, are the one that stand out that really have 
mm. got bang, bang, bang and, and signed three players that immediately improved their, their first team, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I don't think Liverpool have been left behind that much, but I would have expected them to go and get themselves one more player, probably, just just for the 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 long term of this season, if you like, in terms of you know what's going to happen in January. And, you know, it's clear for me that Liverpool have... 17 players, probably 18 players that the manager really, really does back and trust. There are two or three around the squad that he clearly does have doubts about. And I thought maybe they would have tried to replace that, but potentially that might be one that they're thinking they can get another season out of this kind of squad and then maybe refresh next year. Was there a play? I mean, I, I did the podcast with the Diawlasses the other day and the was there a player that went in the window? So who was obviously available for transfer? who went in the window to a club that you thought we could have had him. That has that done us. Um, Because that's the question, isn't it, really? Yeah, well, I suppose I suppose the one that everyone, the Liverpool fans on Twitter would point out would be Saul, who went to, to Chelsea on, on a loan to buy. And that, I mean, that I think that's flown a little bit under the radar for Chelsea. Yeah. Some, some signing from Chelsea, you know, and some well, deal for them. They needed him midfielder. Yeah, yeah. they... Yeah, they, I mean, they, they feel like they need everything, don't they? You know, they, they, they don't mind having four or five players for, for every position. But I didn't, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say so, no. It wasn't, there wasn't one that I looked at and thought, oh, Liverpool have really, really, really missed a trick on that one. Um, you know, some some quite interesting players, you know, Wendy went to Villa and you thought, oh, he's quite a nice player. But, I, you know, I, I still think you need to see a bit more of him. Um Sal would maybe be the one that you say, well, if Liverpool could have got him on a loan deal, you know, he would he would have added to the squads immediately. He's obviously but, looked at it though. Yeah, I, but he's been he's been hawked around this summer, yeah. you know. Clearly, I mean, that, yeah, that, that that's happened, doesn't it? You know, there's there's been a lot of that going on. And um, maybe the one that I would have looked at, and I know it's not one that Liverpool, I don't think, did look at, would be Memphis Depay, who went to to Barcelona because okay. I think I think he's a top player. I think he's you know he's he's a player who can really score goals, he can create goals. He's going on a free transfer and I think, you know, maybe maybe he wouldn't have settled for the role he might have got at Liverpool, but if there was a deal to be done there, I think he would have been someone who added a lot to Liverpool. So I look at him going to Barcelona this summer and think, you know, I wouldn't have minded seeing him at Liverpool. I know there was a link with him in the past. They tried to get him when Brendan was in charge. Um, but no, I don't think there's too many that I look at, you know, I don't think Liverpool are ever going to sign Grealish. They're never going to sign Lukaku, yep. Varane, um, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo. So, yeah, not not too many that I'm looking around with envious the, the, Two Two of the links that were with us most of the way through the summer until they actually went was Marlon and um, Pat Sandaka. I can only yeah. assume Liverpool looked and went now. But yeah. it'll be interesting to see how they progress and you might be thinking three months down the line actually that would have been a decent I mean Daka was 30 million they were both 30 million quid weren't they yeah they were yeah um, I mean Marlon I think his, his agent maybe was a problem with that one he's been you know, all the clients and it's you know Liverpool are a bit wary I think of, of dealing with him I think a few clubs are, are wary of that and especially if you're dealing with I think that's difficult with you know Renato Sanchez another one George Mendes clients and if you're dealing with those players and they're not instantly in your side I think it, may, it becomes difficult to sort of to, to get those players to your club because obviously agents like that have a, a really set plan for those players so they you know they I mean George Mendes is the king of it really if he goes there for a year he goes there then he then he moves to there and you know tends to tends to usually involve Benfica Atletico Madrid Chelsea Wolves you know, those kind of clubs <laughs> um, but I think I would be interested to see how they do. I, I thought Marlon did look like a player, you know, at PSV and in the Euros, that he looked yeah. like a player that would fit Liverpool quite well. I haven't. I have to say, I haven't seen too much of Daka, and I know he's he's gone to a club in Leicester that it'd be interesting to see how he gets on. Yeah. And I think he might he might be one of those. You know, maybe there was a player there. If you look at it, if you look at players who fit Liverpool, I would have thought Harvey Barnes would be one that, mm. that fit Liverpool pretty well. But you look at the price that he probably would have cost this summer. I think it was unrealistic. I think he signed a new contract as well. So there's there are a lot of players out there that are interesting. But for me, it's not one that I look at and say that was the deal that Liverpool should have been doing. Yeah. You know, that was the one that they've missed out on. I think I think probably they're they're a strong position. They could have been a little bit stronger. But I do think sometimes people overstate 
what other clubs are doing, maybe underplay what Liverpool are doing. Definitely. Just before we leave the transfer window, what do you see uh, in Liverpool? What are you hearing in Liverpool's plans for January and, and the summer? Yeah, well, <coughs> excuse me. I'm not sure about January. I'm not, not, not certain Liverpool will be doing too much in January, but we, we thought that last summer and obviously yep. situations change between now and then. So you could end up in a situation where you, you something is obvious and needs to be done. You know, it, it doesn't go down particularly well and I can see why because it does feel a little bit like it's deferring sort of, you know, questions till next summer. But there, there is that feeling that that's the summer that Liverpool are going to have to make some significant moves because the age of the front three, certain players coming into the last year of the contract, potentially, you know, we, we've seen a lot of contracts renewed, but there's still a fair few to do, you know, just off the top of my head, you've still got Salah, you've still got Firmino, Mane, Keita, Oxley chamberlain still in that position. Then there'll be other players who, who will be entering in the last two years at that point. So I think there will be need, there will need to be some refresh. I think Liverpool have got to be looking at players who can instantly upgrade the first team squads and a lot of links with Bellingham recently I think there is an yeah. interest in, in right. Bellingham there as there should be you know given given his age and the type of player he is if Liverpool weren't interested you'd be asking questions but I think he'd be one that you know you'd look at his his type of his profile and his status in the game I think that's the, the level Liverpool will be looking at I think they're going to have to be looking at a forward it, it, it simply it simply has to be the case I don't think they can they can't keep going to the well with those those front three, even if Jota looks like a good player. So I think you'd be looking at that midfield forwards. Defence, you know, touch wood, touch wood. Looks pretty well stocked. You look at all these problems that they it's had. Great, the it? yeah. And you still look and go, well, you've got five centre-backs there. <laughs> like, yeah. Where were they last season? You know, but um, yeah, I think, I think midfield and forward will be where Liverpool will be looking to strengthen. And I think it will be, I would hope it will be gun, gun players who are going to, you know, instantly come in, not not sort of £10 million pound gambles and, and, and sort of looks at that. I think it'll be players who can instantly improve things. If you're enjoying this video so far, please show your support for the Ken7 channel by clicking the subscribe button, the like button, and also clicking the bell for future notifications. If you could also share the video on your Twitter and Facebook account, that will show YouTube's algorithm that you like our content. Do you know about Ken7 merchandise? The link is in the description of this video. We have premium fanware for fans covering Liverpool, Celtic and Scotland. And it's fanware for young and old. So we have t-shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, caps, mugs, you name it, we've got it. Just something else to remember, every purchase that is made on our website, we donate to the Marina Dalgalish Appeal. So you're helping a great cause as well. Great. Um, this season, what have you what have you made of us in the first three games? Yeah, well, I mean, again, the Chelsea game was one of those where I think there was a bit of an anticlimactic feel to it. I didn't really... I didn't really share that because I thought Chelsea played well, and I think sometimes a team's allowed to allowed to play well against Liverpool, yeah. and a team that spends a lot of money is allowed to defend well. And you know, I would have been interested to see what the game would have panned out like. Had let's just say Reese James isn't sent off, but Liverpool get the penalty, does that game play out differently in the second half? I think it maybe does. You know, it set it set the tone for the second half. Obviously, the Chelsea are down to ten men, and they're just gonna sit in and, and, and defend. I thought Liverpool played okay generally in the game, certainly for the first hour. Yeah, they um, played better with 11 men, didn't they? Yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, did. Uh, genuinely. Yeah, Chelsea, you know, Chelsea scored when Liverpool had pretty much been dominated the game, the, the, the first, you know, the first 20 minutes or whatever. Um, and then Liverpool come on strong and, and got back into the game before the break. But I look at the other two games, Norwich and Burnley, and I found, I thought a lot of similarities with the, the, the title winning season, I thought it was just a bit of a power power show from Liverpool. They were they were happy to sort of take the time and be patient, and then wait, and then sort of come on strong when when it mattered. And that was encouraging. I think. I think. Look at the fixtures now. If they can get it's a big game Sunday. If they can get a win there, mm. Crystal Palace and Brentford. Then before you you have a you get stuck right into Manchester City. I think you can be in a really good position there. I think Leeds is the one that I look at and think. That'll tell us a little bit about where Liverpool are at after an international yeah. break and going to Ellen Road. It's going to have a big atmosphere. A couple of players missing, obviously, with, with the Brazilians probably 
certainly with Firmino. Um, but yeah, I think Liverpool are in decent shape. I mean, there, there does seem to be a, I mean, I know Gary Neville and people like that like to have their little digs and things, but there does seem to be this sort of element of almost negativity around Liverpool, and no one's really sort of What's, saying yeah. saying positive things. And I, I don't, I don't, I see a lot of positive things at Liverpool. What's Gabriel Agbonlahor's problem with Liverpool all of a sudden? <laughs> where's, where's all that coming from? I don't know. I, don't, I saw. I did see the quote. It's I didn't it. Yeah. I, I, I mean, maybe, maybe it's there is an element of people who've grown who've grown up with Liverpool as being the dominant force, or not, or maybe not being the fallen dominant force, and people who think Liverpool sort of have this. You know, why does everyone keep going on about Liverpool when they haven't won the league for so long? And now they're obviously they they they've broken that that run. Maybe people worried about going back into that that sort of world where, you know, it's all about Liverpool, it's all about Liverpool. But yeah, I don't, I don't see it. I don't share the negativity. I, I, like I say, I do think they, they, they could have made their life a little bit easier with a, with a forward signing, but I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's a disaster what, what, they, what they've done or I don't think it leaves them in a terrible position. Um, I think they're still capable of winning pretty much any game they play, mm-hmm. you know, home or away. So I think there's a lot to be positive about as long as they can keep players fit. Yeah, completely. I mean, every time I do a podcast, I, I have to ask people about Harvey Elliott because I'm just massively a big fan of his, and he just looks like the business. What's What's your thoughts on on his emergence and and yeah. you know where where you think what his destiny is? I guess. Yeah, well, I think the sky's the limit with him, and mm. you know, you look at. I mean, we I saw you outside the um, the Burnley game, obviously, and he started that, and you go good opportunity for him, played really well. Can play better, which is which is the interesting thing. You know, there's a lot of people maybe who aren't aware of him, see that and go, "Wow, what a performance from Harvey Elliott!" But I've seen I've seen a lot of of him prior to that, and you think, actually, that's him at like six or seven out of ten. You know, he's got he's got another gear. And then you watch him against Chelsea, and the fact that he started that game, I was I was really surprised, but really excited about it. You know, what a what a show of faith that is. You've got Oxley Chamberlain, Cater, Thiago on the bench, Curtis Jones not in the squad, and he and you've know, got the eighteen year old playing. And he, he looked, he just looked at home. He looked, you know, he's such a such a nice footballer to watch. He's got a wonderful first touch. He's got good balance. He sees he sees the game, and I think one of the big things that stands out for me with him is how much he seems to relish the idea of getting stuck in. You know, he's not he's not looking like a a luxury player in there or someone who's, you know, comes alive when the ball comes to him. He, he wants to do all the other stuff. He wants to get knocked down and, and get back up and, and you know, go up for headers and, you know, draw fouls and all those kind of things. And I think the other thing, you look how much the players trust them, you know, Salah gives them the ball whenever he wants. There you yeah. go. Take the yeah. ball, lads. That's you a know, big thing, no isn't it? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. And I always thought that with Steven Gerrard when he played, that there was certain, you know, you knew when Steven... Love the player at Liverpool, you know, because he looked for them every single time he had yeah. the ball, you know, whether it was Torres or Suarez or Raheem Sterling when he came into the squad or people like that. And, you know, when you see that with a player who's 18 and he's playing in the Premier League, I think there's ample reasons to get excited about it. And I think one of the things that stood out in the, in the, in the international break is he got a bit of a knock come out of the England squad and you saw the reaction from, from Liverpool fans. It was like, oh, no, you know, it wasn't like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, our 18-year-old's got a knock. It was oh no, like what are we gonna do? You know, and I'll be interested to see whether he starts on um on Sunday because you have to say he's put himself right in the frame to be part of that midfield three with his with his training performances, his preseason performances, and then he's carried that into the season. Yeah, I mean, just before we go into the leads, a little leads preview, he's he's fit, isn't he? We had that confirmed yesterday. By yeah, yeah, yeah. Like said he's fine. He trained, he trained. He was in the training pitches at, at a Kirby yesterday, along with Milner, along with Van Dijk, Cater. So, you know, as much as the Brazilian situation is frustrating and Minamino, I think, has got a knock as well. Um, it's still a pretty strong squad. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you, how would you go with it? Let's assume that the Brazilians aren't playing. What, what team would you pick? Yeah, well, obviously, I think Kel- well, Kelleher will play in goal if, if, if Alisson's not available. And I think he showed last season that he's got a good temperament. He's, he's good, with, good with his feet, which I think is important. You know, you th- 
I don't want to. I, I I really don't want to get into the, the the Adrian bashing thing, which there'll be a lot of that, obviously. But I think what what stood out most in the Villa game last season sticks out a mile. You know, obviously when he Adrian played the seven two, and I know that's an anomaly, but it was it was maybe the nerves with the ball at his feet that that really set the tone for that game. That you give a goal away, obviously first couple of minutes, and Kelleher doesn't look like he's he's that type. He's he's obviously very comfortable with that, and I think that really helps Liverpool. We saw that. Um, what game was it? Wolves, I think he played last season in the league, and then Ajax in the um, in the Champions League, and didn't didn't look out of place. So don't have too many concerns about him going mm-hmm. into that environment, albeit a different one. Um, Fabinho out, I think you have to put Henderson into that number six position, and then you've got two from what Cater, Thiago, Jones, Elliot, Milner. Um, I would probably go with Thiago and Cater. Right. In that regard, I, I would. I think Cater was a bit unlucky to miss out against Chelsea, albeit we talked about Elliot's performance so well. Um, and I think Thiago, he hasn't started the game yet this season. He didn't go away on international duty with yeah. Spain. He's had he's, you know, he's had time to get right up to speed. I think he's ready now to, to start games. So I would go with Thiago and Cater. Um, I'd, I'd admitting that Elliot's right in the frame, by the way. Uh, and, then, and, then your, and then your front three picks itself with Jota, you know, yeah. Jota, who probably would have started anyway. If Firmino was fit, you, you got the front three there um, of Salamane and, and Jota. So it's not a bad side, is it? Not a bad side at all. You know, Matip and Van Dijk, centre half, Trent and Robertson, full backs. Yeah. You know, I back that to win most games. Yeah, definitely. When you were uh, a bit younger, and uh, you used to follow Liverpool as a fan. Did you ever go to Ellen Road and stand in the, the away end? It, I, yeah. I went a few times. It was yeah, yeah, I was there the day. I was there the day Mark Viduka scored. Did you? Oh. We had that game, were you? Yeah, no way. yeah. yeah. I, remember, I, I think I remember. Would have been the following season. It wasn't the league. I think it was the FA Cup. They went. They went to the F. No, it might, same season actually. I think they went more in the FA Cup. Um, Two 0 I think. I think. Nick Barnby, I feel like Nick Barnby scored. Um, yeah, it, it's a great atmosphere. I mean, it's not, it's it's, it's hostile, and it's intimidating. It's, yeah, and I, horrible. And I know, I know Everton fans went there um, a few years back and had a bit of trouble there with when they went in the in the League Cup, I think it was. Um, so, but it's what it's what we've missed a little bit, isn't it? Yeah. You know, going to. I went, I went last year for the the draw in in April, and you know, you you look at the atmosphere. Or sorry, the the the, the um, the surroundings and such a such a classic ground and it won one team city and that kind of thing and it did feel wrong to be in Ellen Road you know when Leeds have been out the Premier League for so long and it's empty yeah. so it'll be a great atmosphere Sunday you know for our four kick off you know big the sort of the showpiece of the weekend almost isn't it that that game and looking forward to it I think Liverpool I think we talk a lot about Anfield you know the lack of atmosphere at Anfield cost in Liverpool last season I actually think the away the away as well really does cost them because I think these players love that idea of, you know, getting stuck into a, a hostile crowd and, and quieting them and hearing that away end. And we saw that at Norwich first game of the season, you know, that away end was bouncing and it'd be nice to see it again on uh, on Sunday. Yeah, oh, lovely stuff. Listen, is it, what what are you working on at the moment? Anything that you you, you want to mention? Uh, well, yeah, we've got, got the Champions League coming up, obviously, with uh, so back into that and Pretty nice draw, isn't it? With with those with those trips, and you know we talk about fans there, amazing trips for those those guys. They're going to hopefully go on to Porto, Madrid, and Milan mm. um, in the group stage. Haven't been denied Amsterdam last year, and yeah, and and, uh, and places like that. So hopefully they can make amends with that. So we have got some preview content coming up um, in that regards, and yeah, I'm I'm actually longer term. I've got a bit on Luis Suarez. Obviously, he's going to be um, coming back to Anfield. We hope anyway in the uh, in the group stage. So there'll be a big hit on him and his time at Liverpool. Spoken to quite a lot of people about that and some interesting stories and tales Brilliant. from that. So yeah. uh, keep an eye out for that. Oh, well, fantastic. Well, listen, thanks very much, mate. I really appreciate your time. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to give us a little subscribe, click the like button. And um, thanks very much, Neil. Cheers. No problem at all. Thanks for having me.